Good evening, friends. Pari Kalust Angerner and Pari Galust Angerner. My name is Nick Matteo. I'm the program manager at the Armenian Institute in London, uh, and I'm happy to welcome all of you uh, joining here on the Zoom or watching on the live stream on Facebook or watching the YouTube video uh, afterwards. Um, I won't I won't be chairing this evening, but I'll um, just a couple of housekeeping things and a short introduction before I hand over to AI director Tatavika Ivasian um, to uh, chair the evening itself. Um, so firstly, uh, for those who are in the Zoom and those who are also joining on Facebook, you can ask questions um, uh, at the for the event tonight. Um, please do so by using the chat. Also, if you're in the Zoom or on the Facebook, please feel free to introduce yourself, say where you're joining from um, and, uh, and how you're finding the event. Though, of course, any hate speech or hateful speech um, will mean that you'll be uh, removed or blocked uh, straight away. Uh, the event tonight is being recorded and live streamed. Uh, you should only be able to see the speakers, but if you'd like to make sure, then please do make use of the stop video function, um, and then you certainly won't be seen. Um, and uh, I think that's all of the, the housekeeping things um, for this evening. This evening's event is uh, the latest in, in a series that's been running for a, for a well over a, a year and a half, two years now, um, at the Armenian Institute of our diaspora forums, where we platform the views and experiences of young people um, in the global Armenian community. But it's also the first in a new series that we're launching uh, on difficult conversations. And this came out of some discussions which we were having in the Institute um, around some of the topics that are challenging for the global Armenian community or um, seen as taboo, are seen as amot, as shameful, um, but are still important for us to have. Uh, and, and, and of course, while we don't want these to be uncomfortable conversations, we think they're important and they need to be aired. Um, so uh, I'll hand over to Tatavik to talk about uh, the event tonight and a bit more about this idea um, now. Thank you, Nick. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us, and thanks to our uh, panel members for joining us, mostly. Like Nick said, uh, this is, we call the series Difficult Conversations. Uh, and by difficult, we don't want to make anyone feel uncomfortable, but raise difficult topics, as, uh, as Armenians, we tend to follow the concept of Amut, like Nick mentioned the shame a lot and not to discuss a lot of things loudly. So we want to be a bit loud today. And we are very lucky to have three young, talented people joining us uh, who would share some of their personal experience and views and opinions with our audiences. Uh, they are all three Syria highs and while we know a lot about war in Syria and Syria in Armenian history and psyche always remains the place where um, that march is happening in Derzor in 1915 and so many Armenian refugees were welcomed and survived. And Syria appeared in the news again um, uh, about a decade ago about the war, about the refugees and displacement, and a large number of Armenians moved from Syria to Armenia. We've been trying to find some numbers and the estimates uh, differ from 15,000 to 22,000 Syrian Armenians moving to Armenia according to UN Refugee Agency. And according to some estimates, about 14, 15,000 stayed in the country and received an Armenian citizenship. Uh, there, is, there are several legal statuses I think people have received and would be nice if anyone can, any of the panel participants can shed more light on this because some people choose to become citizens, some acquire refugee status and some, some of them are classified as displaced people returning to homeland. Um, again, numbers are unclear and of course there is also anecdotal evidence that there are non-ethnic non Armenians moving from Syria to Armenia. Uh, there's an evidence of Syrians who moved to Lebanon after the civil war in Syria 
again moving to Armenia after the war, um, after the situation in Lebanon, and of course some Syrian Armenians who were in Artsakh come back to Armenia after the Artsakh war. A lot of wars in our very complicated region. But I'd like to stop now and I'd like to invite our panelists to introduce themselves and we'll start a conversation with them. And like Nick said, everyone will have a chance to ask their own questions. Uh, so joining us tonight is Huri Pilibosian, who just moved to London to study and we're very happy to see her tonight. And she's been visiting the Armenian Institute as well. So very exciting. Very excited to have someone like Huri here. Hofseb Markarian, who is a good friend and who was part of the Armenian Institute and a colleague who is now in Armenia, who is going to talk more about himself. And Avo Avetis, I don't know how to introduce her, Avo Aboshan, a good friend who is established in Armenia. Huri, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure, if you want me to. Um, well, I guess to briefly introduce myself, uh, well, my name is Huri. Uh, I, was, I was born in Aleppo, Syria, but um, like, you, like you were referring to that, Evik, I come from a family, so my father is Armenian and I, my mom is Arab, so I have a mixed, mixed background when it comes to the Syrian-Armenian identity. And we are going to talk about this later on, so I will not expand on that, on that point. Um, but yeah, I grew up in in Aleppo, and then in 2012, uh, I was only 17. Uh, we actually had a wedding. Uh, that's why we went to Armenia because the situation in Aleppo wasn't that severe at that point. Uh, and then yeah, we got stuck in Armenia after that, and I've been living there until very recently until October, and then I moved here to London. Uh, I actually did finish my high school in Armenia. I went for the last year in Armenia. Then I started my undergrad at AUA, the American University of Armenia. Uh, my journey was a bit long. I started off as a business student. Then I switched to English and communications, where that's where like kind of also my career started in oral history and research. And yeah, after graduation, uh, I started working as a teaching assistant at AUA for the oral history course. I also started doing research for my previous professors. Uh, well, one of them was my previous professor, Dr. Melissa Bilal and Dr. Lerna Akmetjolu for their new book. Uh, and yeah, now I ended up in London. Uh, I'm studying at Goldsmiths University. I'm doing a master's in social anthropology. And yeah, I guess that's like briefly about me. Thank you so much, Huri. Thanks for sharing it with us and uh, telling with a smile that you just traveled to Armenia and happened to be stuck there because there was there was a war in your homeland. Thank you. Look forward to chatting to you later. Who wants to go next? Hofsep? Uh Yeah, I think what Huri said about going to Armenia and just finding ourselves stuck there is something probably everybody relates to. Uh, we, yeah, I, I, we also went in 2012 with my family. It was the summer. Uh, I, I guess we had a kind of an idea that things were going downhill in Syria. So we, we thought that this might be like a permanent thing. But my also, again, I, I just should mention that I was also born and raised in Aleppo, Syria. So for 17 years, I was there. I went to an Armenian school there, even though the curriculum and everything was in Arabic. We can talk about this later as well. Uh, but yeah, I went to an Armenian school, was surrounded by the Armenian community there. Um, and But I think something that was probably slightly different for me was that both of my grandparents, I mean, grandparents from both sides, dad and maternal and paternal, were in Yerevan before we, we moved there. So uh, one set was there around 2007 and the other around 2010. And that was really helpful for us to transition. Um, and it was a bit of a, like, there was a home to go to. It was, there was familiarity and things like that. So that's something uh, that definitely helped me and my family, which I don't, probably not a lot of people had. Uh, 
I guess that's in terms of the journey. Um, we, we, I met Huri actually at the American University where we, I, I was doing English and communications at the time. Uh, and I was there for two years. Um, and then we, trans, I, we, we moved to Lebanon. So I transferred to university there. Uh, after that, I went to London and I also did my master's there in culture studies at SOAS. Uh, my dissertation or thesis uh, was involved around actually Syrian, uh, young Syrian Armenians in Armenia, so hence the you know, discussion topic of today. Um, again, I can talk about that more later. Uh, and this past two years, again, I've moved back to Yerevan after I did my research here and with the pandemic and everything, I stayed here. I worked for um, EVN Report, which is a media outlet um, for here for a year as a writer and a social media manager. Um, and right now I'm just freelancing and looking for my next job. So that's where I'm at in life. Um, I give Thank, the you so much, <laughs> Thank you so much, Rosa. Thank you so much, Rosa John. We miss you in London. We hope to see you soon. Okay. And I will encourage everyone to look up Hofsep's articles on EVN Report. He's a wonderful writer. And Avo, uh, you're next and you're doing so many things. So tell us everything. Yes. Uh, so I'm Avedis. I'm happy that I'm invited to this conference. Um, let me start from the moving to Armenia. It was 2013 in the winter when we finally took the decision with my family to move to Yerevan. So um, alongside that, Armenia was uh, as an ideological homeland, but as a country, I have never had um, the experience of living uh, there in the country and didn't know anything uh, how things uh, should be done in the country and so on. Um, in the beginning, it was, uh, we faced many hardships, difficulties, but the ideology were always uh, at the heart of our family. Even before war, we had talks that uh, someday we should move to Armenia, but we didn't know when, when's the, when is the time. So uh, when I was a, a university student there at the University of Aleppo, um, the war break out, but I took that difficult decision to stay uh, during the war and bombings around uh, the vicinity, our home uh, at the university area. Uh, I was insisting to complete my BA and after that to move to Armenia. So uh, as a child, I was raised in the Armenian community, the traditional community of diaspora, schools, um, community organizations, as we all know. Um, however, the idea of the homeland for me was always to have um, a statehood, of to feel homeland. Um, although I like the communities uh, uh, just such as yours in London, the Armenians and uh, elsewhere, I have friends. But uh, for me uh, to live and stay permanently, uh, I was searching for statehood. Um, uh, my studies were back in Aleppo, uh, Faculty of Arts and Humanities, uh, History, so um, my paperwork mainly were on uh, Middle Eastern studies, starting from the ancient era until uh, recent. Uh, it was more general. In Armenia, I continued my Master's, uh, Master of Arts in um, International Relations. Uh, it was interdisciplinary studies uh, with Armenian studies. So my dissertation were on Ottoman studies. Uh, after finishing, I worked and during when I was a student, I worked in many areas, large uh, area of interests of mine, um, including the Armenian studies. Uh, I had the work uh, at the University of Yerevan, the Institute of Armenian Studies. Um, I also worked in uh, benevolence uh, organizations. Uh, uh, until recently, I was also involved in uh, student affairs, uh, precisely get, uh, getting scholarships for students from Middle Eastern area coming to Armenia and also Artsakh students were added recently before because of the war. So uh, I also mainly work on Western Armenian issues uh, and the Western Armenians moving to Armenia. Uh, we, uh, we are trying to 
preserve the Western Armenian language uh, and the culture in Armenia. Uh, I currently work in the field of news um, in the government sub subdivision. Uh, so we are spreading news in Western Armenian. Uh, it's a way of preserving the language uh, through the state, the help of the state. Uh, I also uh, have interests at some uh, part-time works in the field of uh, legislative reforms in Armenia. Um, so, as you said, a uh, very general, uh, large area of interest. Um, in the questions I mentioned, uh, I noticed something. Uh, uh, I like that topic, so I want to emphasize, if you give me the time. Um, it was mentioned, uh, speaking of, uh, like, subcultures uh, of the Armenians, the diaspora and Armenians, Kurkahai, there is... Uh, like each Armenian referred themselves from the country they come, Syria high, Lebanon high, America high, and so on. Um, in general, I'm not uh, that positive to divide the Armenians, but when we are studying, doing academic researches, yes, it's very natural because uh, we have subcultures. And I, uh, some couple of times, I, I remember mentioned the term, uh, cultural baggage. So each Armenian comes to Armenia, bring with them their own cultural baggage. Even uh, if we go deeper, we have uh, within Syria, like uh, Armenians from Aleppo, uh, Armenians from the eastern, uh, northeastern Syria. For example, um, those uh, groups also like different Armenians from Damascus. So Aleppo Armenians uh, are the most traditional uh, West Armenian speaking people. Um, their life is urban. Uh, for example, when uh, the Armenian state uh, offered to move to Artsakh, the coming Syrian Armenians, there, there were these subcultural differences because uh, Armenians of Aleppo uh, never been in rural life. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Armenians from the Northeast Syria could have uh, integrated in that offer, go to Artsakh and uh, work in the agriculture. So even we have those, even from the same country, we have different uh, subcultures and sub Uh But given to the history, uh, for example, if we take a general look to Western Armenia, it was always like uh, the church in the middle of each, uh, let's say, district, and the Armenians, like uh, in Van or Mush, the, the church were the church were uh, the main organizers and the main institutions. So in the Middle Eastern diaspora, we had uh, also not just the church, also the uh, organizations alongside the church. So, for example, uh, we didn't have any discrimination. People from organizations had to have uh, general camps. Let's say. Uh, youth from different organizations. They saw each other like Armenians from Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and so on. So it was the integration in the Middle Eastern Armenians uh, we had always have back then. And coming in Armenia uh, also helped to integrate staying here uh, as long as we stayed. Well, for my example, it's seven years now. So we also now had uh, our friends are various. We had friends from Lebanon, from Syria, from Cyprus, also many, many friends from here, from Armenia. I've met, we've become very good friends and co-workers. Thank you, Avo. What an insightful intro. Thank you very much. And you didn't mention one more thing about you, that Avo is also adapting some Western Armenian literary pieces for theater and oh, yes. His Mr. Krikor Zohrab as well, his alter ego, his, um, he successfully staged a few of Zohrab. Um, yeah, it was in story. 2021. Um, it was in yeah. 2020 during um, the quarantine. We, are, we had some thoughts uh, to do to uh, make something with Western Armenian arts, uh, through a cultural and art uh, project to make something uh, preserved, not just preserving, but spreading the yeah. language and the culture we have in Western Armenian. 
So um, I founded the uh, Krikor Zohra project, uh, which is for now we have only theater, but I called the title as Krikor Zohra project to have in the future so many other things as well, like uh, teaching the Western Armenian itself or any innovation in the innovations uh, under the same title. Um, I must mention that it was very um, cool. Uh, people came and watched uh the it was called the count the voices of conscious uh so the title was taken from the book of krikor zohra one of the books which include uh, novels short novels uh it was based on posta so we tried to mix and mingle and integrate we had some actors that are native western armenians had some actors were, were uh, Armenians from Armenia, but they had some experience in playing uh, traditional Western Armenian uh, stages. So we invited them. Uh, it was one of the points uh, of the project to have that uh, integration and uh, mingling. Uh, otherwise, we could have just uh, like bring all of actors uh, natives, but it was part of the program to uh, include and integrate uh, actors and actresses if if they have the will to play in western armenian and work with them to uh, learn the language more professionally thank you abo thank you and it would be good to continue this conversation about the use of western armenian later on but um, i hope we'll see your uh, place uh, one day in london as well thank you everyone for sharing your stories, your incredible journeys with us and all your adventures between three of you. There can be not just a play, but a series of really long, epic Game of Thrones style films made. Um, we've discussed some questions already with you and three of you just provided three very different journeys and why and how you moved accidentally, planned, got stuck there, your grandparents were there, Hofse. you've been in Armenia before, you haven't been in Armenia. Ken, I'd love to know just your general views, what's, what's your feel, how people make this choice to move to Armenia, an actual physical journey, how does it happen? I was trying to read and obviously there's a route probably flying through Lebanon or via Georgia or Turkey. Can you share some? stories or opinions about these choices to move. Please unmute yourself, whoever wants to go first. And um... OK, uh, we can um, start with Huri again, if you want, like <laughs> keep the range <laughs> as it was. OK, yeah, if you want me to, I can go. Um, well, to answer your questions, like personally, we had to fly. There were like direct flights from Aleppo to Yerevan mm -hmm. back then. Um, I mean, there are flights now as well, but in 2012, it was still Armavia, the company, and they were allowed to fly over Turkey. So the, the journey was very, very short, like less than an hour sometimes. So yeah, but these flights uh, stopped in, in, in December 2012. Uh, mainly because of Aleppo's uh, airport. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, uh, the choices are very personal. I, we, this is something we cannot generalize because each one has to, like like Hofsep said, like his grandparents were there. For us, my dad's work was connected to Armenia. So it was, a, it was an easier choice for us to move to Armenia rather than somewhere else or even stay in Syria or go to Lebanon or... To, Europe wasn't in the Europe and Canada were not in the mix still in 2012. So, so yeah, more or less, it was in for for us as a family, it was easier to move to Armenia because my dad had a job, we had connections. It was easier for us to you know arrange a house to live in. Uh, uh, we we also like as a you mentioned passports before. So part of the reason why we went to the wedding was also to get our passports. Uh, my parents did have a passport before we moved, but yeah, I got it in 2012, like when we we were actually still quote unquote visiting. Um, so so yeah, there were like all these 
things that make uh, that made the move easy uh, i'm just, like i know from from our friends like some of them actually had to drive uh, through turkey then georgia then armenia and this was still in 2012 and up, I, I i think up until 2013 when the borders with like turkey syria closed uh, and then yeah like there are different uh, different routes where you could take like a beirut flight or at some point people were flying to dubai or driving to Beirut, then Dubai, then, then Armenia. But but yeah, there's also like the economical factor, of course, uh, because if we compare, uh, Armenia at some point was a bit a bit like economically cheaper to afford than Lebanon if you didn't have a job or something. Um, for some people, they already owned some sort of property in Armenia, like a house, or it was like in progress. So that also made the move easier. Of course, I cannot talk for everyone else. These are just like ex my experience and like the experiences of my friends and people that I've talked with. And yeah, yeah maybe like Hofsep, you want to go and continue? Actually, I think you summed up everything. I, I don't think there's anything else I wanted to say. Our personal journey was through a flight like direct from Aleppo to Yerevan. And as, as Rui was saying, everybody's journey was different. There were the car journeys and plane journeys and uh, and also choices of people who stayed longer in Syria or, um, or people returned from Armenia back to Syria maybe more than once um, to make up their minds and people who went from either from directly from Syria elsewhere to North America or Europe or elsewhere or from Armenia to other places. So these journeys are <clears throat> they're multiple and uh, everybody just uh, had to figure out whatever thought is was best for themselves and their families yeah yeah that's that's the interesting thing because when you read about it in media i was searching for some statistics and if you look at about this particular displacement in un refugee agencies website it looks um very streamlined narrative this many people moved from syria to armenia and there are so many layers, there are so many different communities, like I was saying, there are people who are the Aleppo close knit community, there are people from Kurdish region, there are people who had no absolutely no choice, they had to flee. And there are people who were comfortable and well off and could afford to buy a nice place and move there. And I think previous connections probably shaped the choices as well, if you like. In your family's case, who had a job connection or grandparents like you have said, maybe it was a more obvious choice to make. I just want viewers as well to have the breadth and all the layers of what's going on. And I've read some really horrific journeys, really dangerous journeys through Turkey and Georgia when the flights were stopped and some people could be there in a few hours like you mentioned, Harini, some people were risking their lives and uh, literally picking which possessions to take with them. Um, I would, did you want to add anything to this uh, question? Yeah, actually, I want to continue where Huri left because at the end of 2012, the Aleppo International Airport was closed until 2017. So uh, people staying there had two choices either the road trip through Turkey, Georgia, which was uh, which, uh, a road that is that was not under the Syrian government regime, and the other road, uh, Aleppo, Beirut, and from Beirut flying to Yerevan, this road was uh, under the government. So um, the choice was personal, and but uh, people who took the north, it was more dangerous. So we heard stories of kidnapping, because it wasn't uh, under the government, uh, so kidnapping and so on. So I choose the road trip from Aleppo to Beirut. And uh, I must mention that it was very stressful and uh, an adventure that uh, I'm thinking to write down one day as a story because it's uh, beyond the movies. Um, you leave everything on, uh, I, we leave everything on that road. You see the war on your side, uh, jungles being fired at uh, both sides, shooting each other. So a very stressful and adventurous road it was. Um, 
even after that, uh, when I'm at cinema now, I say, uh, oh, the sounds are very cheap and uh, they're not real because when you are in, in that, you, you see, you hear everything that bombings and everything is so much louder than we see on the screen. Um, after that, from Lebanon to Yerevan is uh, more quiet. Uh, through flight, we came here to Yerevan. Um, we had some family, like my aunt family were uh, here. Uh, they came a year earlier than us. Uh, they they have been of help, but we didn't really had uh, like many relatives or close friends that we can uh, ask uh, everything for the uh, for, for help or anything. Because of that, uh, the earlier months were uh, more difficult to, to get integrated. Thank you, Abo. Thank you so much. There's a quick question in the chat saying, why did people already have a house in Armenia? And I think number of reasons, number it's a lot of ethnic Armenians who could probably afford uh, property in Yerevan or would travel often or had some businesses or maybe had a plan to move on later on that many diaspora Armenians would uh, purchase a lot of, especially there was so much construction going on at some point in Yerevan. So probably there was a huge supply of places to buy. Um, let's get to difficult questions now. The, the million dollar question. Uh, we talked about moving to Armenia, but in the Republic of Armenia, in Armenian in high stance narratives, the word uses repatriation, which is literal translation, returning to your homeland. And I've seen so many extreme opinions and views about it. I know people who passionately hate the word because they have no connection to that particular land. Their homelands are somewhere else. They're in Adana or Marash or somewhere else. Or there are people who feel they've given a home and safety and feel settled in Armenia. And this should be the policy of Hayastan Republic Armenia be to encourage repatriation. Um, what are your views? What do you think? Is it just a word? And some people told me it's just a word. Why make a big deal out of it? Oh, all of you are smiling. I, looks like all of you have lots of views about it. I'm just wondering whether we should go it's, like in it's the a same very order safe, or? <laughs> it's a very safe space. You're only like online. Oh, you go this time. <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, repatriation. I mean, I guess I guess you, we don't have to make a big deal out of it. And some people maybe um, find it like a, find like a sentimental attachment to it. And some people don't. I'm one of those who don't I, because I don't consider it a, a repatriation. Uh, repatriation for me would be to a place where probably I was born or my direct family probably was from, but that's not the case. So uh, I, Armenia is an ancestral land, but it's not, it's not where, like my, my ancestors come from different parts of Eastern Anatolia or previously Western Armenia. So that's a, that's, that would be a repatriation, but which also creates other layers of, um, you know, com com complexity, which, uh, we can get into or not, but no, for me, it's not repatriation. Maybe it's a return to ancestral land, but not repatriation. I don't consider myself a repatriate, which uh, there is a community of people here who consider themselves that. Thank you, Hafsev. Uri and Davo, tell us your views. Um, yeah. The, um... That's good. We have uh, contrast because uh, I can say different answer that uh, Offset stated. Um, you know, I want to emphasize that uh, if we look through the history, um, it's not everything happened to Armenians, especially Western Armenians, uh, were like democratic or by choice. So sometimes uh, things happened by force 
by force and that force make us stay Armenians. For example, the different culture, the different civilization in the Ottoman Empire, Armenians wanted to stay Armenian and not Turkified or Islamized, for example. Uh, so it wasn't uh, like for every individual pleasant to um, speak or let's say learn the Armenian literature. But uh, even earlier, in earlier history, when the church was more in charge, I mean, um, they forced people, they forced the students, the school students, aged children to uh, like learn Armenian, uh, not, not by their own will. So that was um, something in our destiny to sometimes not we choose to do, but uh, given the situation, the political, the sociocultural, uh, we were we were forced to a preserve. Um, same we can say at Syria, we were born and we were going to Armenian school, although learning just um, language, history, like uh, religion classes, let's say. Not everything uh, in Armenian, uh, for example, sciences and so on. But um, the same I can say for coming to Armenia, because people uh, who had businesses uh, in their own countries, they always said, oh, you know what, we have our work, we have our houses, someday perhaps we move to Armenia. But when the war came, we were once again forced to take a decision to come to Armenia. And as for the historical Armenia, I can't say, I mean, uh, for, from Gilikian Armenia, um, I can just visit, right? Uh, as long as we don't have something, some principality, Armenian principality there, I can't consider uh, those places of homeland or places I can go back and live. So homeland for you is more connected to... Like yeah, we should have a statehood with uh, everything, like, uh, let's say, other nations, if the Germans have Germany, uh, for example, French people have France, although uh, sometimes the, their, the, their situation is more complicated if you have like Francophone countries and English speaking countries or the Commonwealth, people might um, go. But for the Armenians, yeah, uh, if we had Armenia as a Republic of Armenia or uh, Republic of the Armenians, if I might say, so. Um, is the only legitimate uh, state uh, that we should come and make the country stronger. I like the sound of Republic of Armenians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, Avo, Avo Shans plans for world domination. <laughs> um, Ahuri, what do you think about world repatriation and Tyrone Adarsu Tun? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm like more of on Hofsep's page, on, on like me and Hofsep are on the same page with this because I also don't look at my experience as repatriation because, because we didn't repatriate, with repatriation, you have this certain ideas in mind and it's pre-planned and, you know, you go there with, with a mission and for us, it wasn't that and I, I don't see it like that. Um, yeah, and for me as well, like it was interesting because I had visited Armenia in 27, two, sorry, in 2007 when, you know, I went for a scouts camp in Armenia. And to be very honest, I didn't like it. Like I was, that was my first cultural shock. And I'm like, okay, is this Armenia that, you know, we learn about our entire lives? And I actually didn't like it. Uh, so, so yeah, my first two few years in Armenia were like, I don't want to live in this place. I completely rejected the idea of Armenia. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, over the years, my experience changed. But after nine years of living in Armenia, it's still, it's still not a place that I can consider a home or I don't have this connection to the word Hyrenik per se. Mm -hmm. um, it is a place that is more familiar than any other country that I would live in at some point. But yeah, like that sense of, you know, fully belonging or the sense of home is, is wasn't there for me in Armenia. Um, and yeah, like uh, Avo, you mentioned the, the growing up in, in Aleppo and stuff. Yeah, for me, like growing up, I, I lived a dual life because 
I was like at home speaking both Armenian and Arabic. Uh, in my like even social life, I was interacting with Armenian and Arab circles. So for me, there was like always this making connections and figuring out the cultures as well, uh, which added an extra layer to this to this narrative. Uh, and yeah, that, then again, I don't mean when I say like Armenia is not home, I don't necessarily mean that in a negative way. No, but it's just that it comes out of my experience with Armenia and and how I lived there and, and you know, what I was expecting and what we, we kind of gave to each other in a sense. Thank you. Thank you, Huri. I think a lot of people in the audience, a lot of us would relate to this idea of not having just black and white, this is home, this is not home. Um, I was talking to someone recently who realized I've lived in London longer than I've lived in Armenia. And they said, oh, so this must be home. And I thought, no, it's not automatic, like bang, 20 years, get there. And mm -hmm. there are different shades and shapes of home. This is London, it's home and Ermini is home and they're all home in different ways. And my heart belongs to all these places in some ways. I'd like to pick up a question from the audience because it's relevant and we'll continue with our questions. This is a question from Armenak Topalian. He says, how are those who move to Ermini since 2012, relating to those who emigrated to Armenia in the Nergacht. And Armenak, we notice you don't use the word either. I, I, I wish you tell us what you think about it. Who wants to try to answer this question? Um, I think by Nergacht, he means uh, in the 1940s and so on during yeah. the Soviet times. So, um, yeah, we, if we have to compare, uh, also we have the, this um, cultural shock or disappointment for them as well, because they uh, lived with uh, the Armenian songs and uh, things about uh, homeland. But the, when they came, um, the country was the, under the Soviet Union and wasn't everything uh, like now. So now um, the Republic of Armenia is, uh, free and not in any uh, like directly in any empire it, it might be in uh, trade unions and so on um i think yeah uh, but at that time uh, also war like were everywhere uh the world war ii and after that uh, the soviet war i think uh, was started as well so yeah the history of uh, repatriation uh, apparently always um, linked with wars but as Huri said um, people coming uh, to Armenia uh, at the first glance uh, yeah the cultural shock is there because uh, especially the ideologist Armenians who are who are like have more um, great uh, like ideologies or um, uh, concepts about uh, Armenia about the historical homeland and by coming and seeing that um, Armenia is a post-Soviet country uh, where there is corruption and so on in the country. So yeah, many people, uh, I won't, uh, I can say that they were disappointed. Uh, some of them chose to stay, they survived, they now have businesses. Uh, others just left uh, for another countries, Western countries, mainly Canada and Scandinavian countries. Uh, if I just may add something about the uh, connection potential between people who moved during the Nerkacht period and then Syrian Armenians lately. Um, I actually recently found out that we have a relative or a family actually of relatives who moved during that period. And I was not aware of this. I was just told that, oh, these, these people are our relatives and I met at my cousin's house. And it, uh, there seem to be the connection in terms of, to me, they seem like any other like East Armenian family or Derati uh, Armenians, local Armenians. So I, I wouldn't have known from like a first glance, even if I just heard them like that, uh, to have known that there were Syrian Armenians. But then I was told of the fact and I was like, okay, well, this, this actually makes sense. So I think in terms of um, culture and um, sort of societal, norms and behavior and things like that, there, 
they're probably they're quite different. And I, I don't think there's that much connection, or at least I haven't seen that, between Syrian Armenians who came at this like, later wave, um, as Abu was saying, after the Syrian war and the, the wave before during the Nekar. So I, I think there's a connection. I don't know if um, anybody would um, say otherwise. Yeah, what Josep says is interesting. So um, I remembered something uh, from this conversation. So uh, uh, according to this, we have like uh, before Nerkacht and so on. Um, we can say that the language or the culture, Western, Eastern Armenian, we do not have that hot uh, border because we had the Nerkacht. So they were originally Western Armenian speakers. Uh, and then uh, through the narrations, they adapted to the Eastern, as well as the people uh, in Chirag province, people of Gyumri in our Republic of Armenia. Most of them uh, were people when, uh, after the first the fall of the First Republic of Armenia, people from Kars province and other provinces that we have lost uh, after uh, 1922. So also Western Armenians moved to Chirag province and. Uh, until today, we can feel, we can taste their Western Armenian accent while they are speaking like uh, the general Eastern Armenian in Armenia. So uh, it's important to emphasize that the border is not that harsh. We do not have that harsh border between Western Armenian, Eastern Armenian sub -ethnoses. That's true. That's an important point to remember. Yeah, yeah. And I think about Nerkar, people probably came with far less information and knowledge about Armenia and their ideas of the homeland was probably much more romantic and reality probably much harsher. And we all know the cases of people going back and not staying, so probably different, different circumstances. Huri, did you want to add anything to this question? Um, no, because like my answer is similar to Ofsep's. I also have family members who who moved uh, who moved back then, and they actually moved back to Aleppo, but they they always spoke in Eastern Armenian. But we we you know, for me it's very natural because I grew up with it, so I couldn't. So that's how I also got my Eastern Armenian in a sense. Uh, I heard it in Aleppo before moving to Armenia. Mm -hmm. But like you said, that it's like they it was more romanticized back then than it is now because we also have this, you know, now you have access to social media and people are seeing things, are actually have access to visual stuff as well, and they can see what Armenia look, looks like, or they can watch videos, whether they are made in a realistic or in an unrealistic way. But now you have more sources of information and you can your your experience can be more real in a sense yeah that's true thank you um moving on to the next question something Avo you've touched upon briefly about all these layers of identity we have we've all been to that one armenian party when you go highest or it says high stances syria highest Hayastani Vormas, it says, which part of Armenia come from, where are, which part of Yerevan? And I always, people would have noticed if your parents are Nerkach generation and you live in Armenia, it's always mentioned you, it's another little distinction, Hayastansian, but I have the Western Armenian connection. Like we were always reminded with Levander Petrosian, who was born in Syria, obviously. And he, if he would use a word which was more Western Armenian, people would be like, ah, Aleppo, it's a... And <laughs> so what's, what are your views? How, how do you feel about your identity? Where, where are you between Spurka High, Syria High, Syria High who is in Yerevan, Syria High who has traveled all over the world? Um, Sometimes people say that, um, especially some friends said from Lebanon, Lebanese Armenians, they said they're getting annoyed when people in Armenia constantly saying, where are you from, based on their uh, speaking accent. So um, in order to make that situation softer, to soften that situation, I can say that 
Um, it's a natural um, habit in Armenia because even uh, people of Yerevan say things about people of Gumri, people of Armenia say things about people of Artsakh. Uh, someone might say, oh, how, how are Artsakh Armenians speaking? I can't understand. They uh, have very bold like accent. They have very bold Armenian and things like that. Or other persons say, oh, how, uh, the accent of Gumri from uh, uh, Armenians from Gumri, it's it's a kind of bolder accent. The Yerevani accent is the standard. So that um, <laughs> gossiping about each other in, in Armenians, uh, it's a thing that we have. Uh, I want to say uh, we, we shouldn't take as an offense when, say, when saying you're Western Armenian or you're from Syria. But uh, as I said, when we are studying, doing um, researches, we should mention every subculture, uh, every cultural bag baggage that we bring with us. Um, yeah, burning a Western Armenian is really a problem <laughs> around the world. Um, but yeah, uh, in general, uh, I am for uh, the unity of the Armenians. But as I said, uh, each Armenian coming from, they, they bring something with them that we cannot uh, like get rid of that. Thank you, Avon. I guess your dissertation was more or less about the identity of young uh, Syrians in Armenia, if you can talk a bit about this. Yeah, uh, I think, again, this is very personal and it differs from one person to another, from one generation to another. Um, during my research, I looked at 20 to 22 year old uh, Syrian Armenians who had lived for uh, you know a substantial time in Armenia almost from 2012 or 2013 uh, and uh, most people I think identify as Syrian Armenian uh, to mean that they are Armenians from Syria or uh, and I from the questions and the conversations I came to the conclusion that there was more emphasis on Armenianness rather than Syrianness. Uh, or closer attachment and identification with that. Uh, and I, I, know, I, I guess for me, it's, it's kind of hard to, I, although I also use Syrian Armenian, or I would say Spirkahai, Suryahai, Diasporan Armenian, I would use all of these. But I think when it comes to the core of it, it's, it, it's hard for me to completely relate to just Syria or only to Armenia. It's, it's a mix of things. And the fact that I've uh, also traveled and been influenced by Western culture, in a sense, whether that's through the language or TV and things like that, it's just I, my identity is quite a mix of things. So I can't fully say I'm one thing. Uh, but maybe just to use the, uh, separate categories like diasporan could make more sense. Because when we say diasporan, whoever has been a diaspora and could probably relate with that. But when it comes to the specific things like ethnic backgrounds or nationality and things like that, it's it's much more personal and com complex from one person to another. Thank you. That's an interesting insight to your research you've done. And then diaspora presents how you define it, its own problems, because there's the traditional diaspora, which is West Armenian speaking diaspora. And then there are people like me who is highest dance living in diaspora. And instinctively, a lot of people said, no, you're not diaspora, you're, you're an East Armenian speaker, has dance you cannot be. So you, you sort of, at some point, you lose the sense where you are, but then the extraordinary sense of unity we all had during the first days of the war, just prove that we're all ready to shed all these layers of identity and be united and feel the common pain. It's sad we're united by pain more often than joy. Um, Huri, did you want to say something about this? Um, yeah, well, uh, one thing about like to pick up on what Avo said, uh, and like even in diaspora communities, you have this divides because uh, like I, I say this like sadly because we only divide when like there's something standing against us, you know. Uh, but like even with the Syrian Armenian community, like speaking of something I come from, where I come from, like you know, the first question is like, oh, are you Syrian Armenian? Then they start asking you like, 
oh, which school did you go to? And, you know, that kind of puts you in a certain box where you might or you might or might not belong. You know, there are always these types of categorizations, even within diaspora communities. And even within that small, you know, like, so which school did you go to? And then like, which part of the school did you go to or whatever, you know, uh, there are always these divides and they, they've they always been there, I guess, whether we like it or not. Uh, and then like to how I identify, I we talked about, about this, like we, we talk about this with Hosep a lot and we talk about like the hyphenated, he talks about it in his research about the hyphenated identity and, and, Hofsep, allow me to <laughs> to quote from your research and like because like with you know with the army with the with the American let's say when you say like African American, it it refers to you know somebody who is born in in the U S and raised in the U S but they kind of you know have this roots to to any other place but with Syrian Armenians it it's kind of it's kind of different. Uh, and for me personally, it's even more different because I don't always say that I'm Syrian Armenian. I have to give this background because I'm, I'm a different type of Syrian Armenian. I'm like, you know, half, half, like we say. Uh, so yeah, like I even contemplate using the word Syrian and Armenian, like the and changes things instead of the hyphen. So, so yeah, I think for me personally, it's a juggle between the two because I don't see I don't see myself checking boxes to fit in each each identity that I own and and I myself like Hofsep I I'm very influenced by Western cultures and especially in Armenia like going to an American university and you know being I mean that was also a way of what that helped me personally integrate because because at at AUA I was speaking to people in English like to people who speak Eastern Armenian in English. And after we establish that friendship, then we start, you know, we start learning from each other. Like they would ask me things in Western Armenian. I would ask for things in Eastern Armenian. And with those friends, now we ended up, you know, we kind of, we started speaking more and understanding each other's cultures, I would say more. But, but yeah, like it's interesting that it started in English and it was like Western cultures was the like the mediator between between these identities. That's an interesting point. So you needed an external reference point, then you could juggle. I love the this metaphor of juggling different identities and different one different balls go up and down at different times and of course uh, talking about your schools i'm sure everyone knows the joke about the armenian on a desert island who built two churches mm -hmm. the one they go to and then the one they don't go to so very good that we are very good at it um a few times you mentioned obviously issue of west east armenian and i can see we have a few questions about it as well is it one of the major obstacles when you go? Because Turi, obviously, you mentioned the culture shock and our actually very first diaspora forum, which we held with four young diaspora Armenians in London. And I think they were all in unison saying first time they went to Armenia, they experienced the culture shock. They grew to like it more or less, but the first reaction was like, oh, this is not the nice pictures of masses and pomegranates my school showed me. Is language a major issue? Um, it is an issue actually, um, because in general, the spoken Western Armenian, especially the accent of Aleppo and Beirut is not, completely understood in Armenia, um, but um, we can't generalize because people, uh, there are people there which are familiar with that, uh, people who had like uh, relations, relatives or business relations with the diaspora. Uh, but yeah, in general, um, in the beginning, in 2011 until 14, 15, uh, people might not understand you quite well if you kept your, like uh, the accent you used to use uh, back in Aleppo, uh, back in Syria or Lebanon. So uh, the issue is there, but 
On the other hand, it's not that big issue that you can say, oh, you know, we, we do not, we can't communicate. Uh, because even with the, the language differences, Western, Eastern, I have witnessed people started businesses um, and within that businesses, um, they taught each other how, th how things uh, aimed in Western Armenian, in Eastern Armenian, and an integration was happened through that process. So um, yeah, there is the issue, but um, looking from far away it's you can see you can feel more harshness while living in that um it's more like uh more neighboring is it more of a linguistic problem rather than just a reluctance to accept to see someone other than slightly different who speaks a different language um in general, when you go somewhere, the local people, um, they expect from the coming people to integrate, to learn their language, uh, mm -hmm. no matter what country we are speaking. So even in Syria, if you can't speak Arabic, people might say, oh, well, you can, if you cannot speak Arabic well, people might say, why you're living, for example, 100 here in Syria, you should speak. So I think it could be like that. But on the other hand, um, the, there should be more, um, the awareness level must be raised in Armenia itself. Because in literature, uh, people know, they're familiar with the literature. Uh, they had some theatrical plays in Western Armenian, traditional plays like uh, Mezapati, Murad Skanner, and so on. But in general, yeah, the, uh, we can work on the rising the level of the awareness and putting more Western Armenian. Uh, that, that is a thing I'm working on currently, putting more Western Armenian in the general Armenian language books without making uh, special Armenian, Western Armenian classes, but uh, integrating, including Western Armenian um, literature lessons, uh, Western Armenian grammar in the books, in the textbooks in Armenia, uh, because uh, eventually uh, any Armenian branch is the language of, uh, uh, is the language of all Armenians, not just Armenians of diaspora. Uh, as a literature pieces, it belongs to the people of Armenia as well, the Eastern yeah. Armenians as well. The Constitution of Republic of Armenia says that the official language is Armenian without specifying Western or Eastern, which are both equal branches, equal mm -hmm. variants of the language. Mm -hmm. And I agree, in most cases, a minority moving into a country would be expected to speak, the learn the majority's language, but this is a unique case. This is not an Armenian coming mm -hmm. to the UK and expecting UK government suddenly look after my linguistic needs. Mm -hmm. But these are people you're moving to a country where Western Armenian allegedly is a, an official language. It's a language which literary pieces are taught in the school, mm -hmm. uh, which Western Armenian figures in art, politics, history are revered and taught about. But suddenly when real, real Western Armenian persons stands in front of them, people's mind go blank. And I've seen quite a reluctance about Western Armenian. Uh, there was a recent move in the parliament to give a special status to Western Armenian. I don't know what happened to it and which I thought very odd that we've noticed only now that Armenian has another variant. And I've seen extremely negative, very positive, but also extremely negative opinions to it, that why do we need after the war and the countries in pieces, or oh, you're thinking about introducing another language and it's going to confuse our children further. Um, and I will, just a quick question to you before I ask Korean Hofsev about their opinions about the language. You say, we are trying to do this. Who is we? Western Armenian speakers, you as someone who lives in Armenia? Yeah, that was a good question. Uh, I can continue from the previous one uh, when Huri said, oh, and by the way, Huri, I liked uh, how uh, you mentioned in the bio, so Syriac Armenian, that was interesting to me. At the first glance, I was 
looking, oh, uh, uh, is it something wrong in the orthography? And said, oh no, Syriac or Syriac Armenian. So please continue using that, um, like an uh, ethnical background. It's 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 the right uh, term to use. Um, yeah, uh, continuing that thing. So as a person, as my personal choices, I can't um, befriend or become best friend with someone just for the reason of the background, the ethnical background, let's say, because of he or she is from Aleppo, Armenian from, or Syrian Armenian. So my um, community or society, uh, the current society here in Armenia is consistent of people that uh, have the same concepts about things uh, uh, art lover or artists, um, people who uh, linguists or working on theater think projects with Western Armenian. So eventually you form your uh, community, your vicinity uh, through people that you have things in common, not because of, for example, let's say uh, from Syria or from Aleppo. Uh, so that is a general thing. Uh, also, like uh, there is Garo in uh, our audience, the same thing. I mean, we are from different parts of the world, but if we have things in common, we can discuss on uh, topics on genocide and Western Armenian things, so we can become friends. Um, you can't just be uh, close with someone or some people uh, just because of the ethnicity. Of course, we have friends that are Syrian and Lebanese Armenians that we have things in common. But yeah, I wanted to emphasize uh, this precisely. And yeah, my uh, by saying we, uh, the team I have, uh, friends that we believe uh, in the same things. For example, in this project, uh, my local Armenian friend was helping me, who is a teacher of Eastern Armenian in, our, in the different schools here in Yerevan. So it was both uh, our both ideas and uh, he initiated to invite me uh, at the schools he works. Uh, his name is Arsen Bartanian. So uh, he initiated to invite me uh, whenever they have the Western Armenian figure, a Western Armenian writer at the textbook that they should learn about. So we kind of joined initiative to uh, make this thing, make it as an event. So it's also uh, a very like a people friendly thing to make the class as an event to have a, a guest speaker uh, who emphasizes things from Western Armenian. I always write things uh, from the orthography and gra grammar on the whiteboard. And it, they ask, they, I, I've seen the interest because in the older generation, uh, we have the professors, the teachers, because I've worked with them uh, in large scale. Uh, there is um, the thing from their side that they, per they personally think that, oh, you know, your orthography is very difficult. Oh, I don't think the uh, um, school people might uh, integrate or understand it. But it's it's their uh, I mean it's their thing, uh, way of thinking. It's not correct because uh, visiting the schools, people were uh, interested. They ask they asked me questions about, uh, for example, uh, what word in Western Armenian, uh, how you read that, how you write that. So um, the, that the, that old concept is uh, comes from the older generation that the people, the professors or the teachers, they, they thought that, uh, you know, uh, it is uh, if, uh, difficult to, uh, to, be, to get uh, equated with different orthography or the other branch of the language. Uh, I want to say it's not uh, correct. The thing is um, the Republic of Armenia does not have uh, enough uh, number of teachers if we are going to really like uh, make a chain but um uh, it's a thing that we can solve because we have like many repatriates here or uh, western armenian speakers we have also um teachers from aleppo uh i think hosep also knows they might have been uh his teachers uh if if he went to jemaran back to aleppo so yeah uh we have community we have um slowly uh, giving to the Western Armenian the status you mentioned. 
uh, 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 of course, it's not clear what uh, the National Assembly wants to do, but slowly uh, we are the active team are uh, getting uh, pluses, getting things in the uh, in this uh, area. We had uh, the radio time used in Western Armenian in the public radio of Armenia starting from 2016. As a result, a uh, big conference we were organized. Uh, so after that, um, slowly we had, uh, now we have the uh, news from the also public uh, channel of Armenia, Bahanrain uh, Arachin Ali, where I read the news uh, as a news commentator uh, for now. So yeah, uh, slow steps uh, uh, are being taken. And after a couple of days, I will also uh, uh, have uh, some um, a little message that I will say from the language community, uh, la language committee of the Republic of Armenia. So yeah, I'm involved in uh, working with them as well. Um, although the steps are very slow, but yeah, we can say the will. Uh, the, there is the will from the authorities to make this integration. Thank you, Abel, and thank you for this positive outlook. My personal take is far gloomier, I have to confess. I'm trying not to bring personal opinions, and I'm waiting for the beautiful day when the um, uh, diaspora high commissioner's office will have a website in Western, West Armenian next to East Armenian, Russian, and English. But it's wonderful to hear that things are being changed. And I think you're right, the way to do it just to reduce this gap between us and them and their language and our language. Uh, Horin Hofsev, I want to ask you, and we have just a question I was going to, I was thinking about what the West Armenian you speak in Armenia, does it become this hybrid East Armenian? Wants us and do drop in use the Russian words. We we joke about this. We say Arev Madavi Elav Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> yeah, but but I think what what like what, with what Avo was saying. Um, I think the, the integration of the language or the, the, the understanding is becoming much more organic now because I noticed this, like when I first moved to Armenia, of course, there was this resistance on my side that, you know, why are they not understanding what I'm saying? And then there was also the resistance from the other side. Like it's not, a we can't look at this. It's not a one-sided issue here. Um, and like for me personally, I was, like Western, uh, I heard Eastern Armenian in Aleppo through my dad's work friends, to family members. So it wasn't this like completely new language for me, but still like in Armenia, it was way different with the Russian words, with, with all the added slang that you cannot find uh, uh, in books per se or in literature. Um, but over the years, uh, like, people also got used to it. Like Western Armenian became part of Yerevan, at least now, like you can, you can walk into, and I'm talking from like everyday life experiences. I'm, I'm not even touching education I at this point. I noticed that in my two weeks in Armenia as well. And it was wonderful, it was very refreshing to hear Western. Western. Yeah, and there's also this genuine tendency for people to learn from each other, you know, uh, people are, because like that resistance is dying out at some point, like there's no fear on both sides. Uh, I think like people who speak Western Armenian are more easily being integrated with Eastern Armenian and the same with like Eastern Armenian speakers. They are like, they have this, this curiosity to also learn and see. And because after all these years, like we got used to each other living in the same city, uh, you know, and we started working in the same companies, uh, studying together at the same universities. So we also, I laughed about this a lot, but like usually with, with Syrian Armenians, they call locals like Mahalli, which is, which means locals in Arabic. So now my like local friends, they know this word and they laugh at it. And, you know, they say like, oh, you call us like Mahallis. 
because you want to talk about us or something. So, so they are also learning the, the slang and the, the, these are like Arabic words that we add when we speak in Western Armenian sometimes, like Eastern Armenian speakers are picking them up like we are picking up the Russian words, you know? So I think the awareness is, uh, is spreading anyways, but when it's forced, it creates more resistance sometimes. But when it's like it's happening genuinely, it's just like organically flows into the system and it, may, it might take longer time than a forced one, but it might result in something better. I don't know. <laughs> No, absolutely. On this sort of social level, it's it. I found it wonderful and refreshing and exciting. And of course, your younger generation, that you're more connected. You have been a diaspora Armenian of my age who lives in Armenia or outside. We're less connected and we have less in common. Thanks to technology, you have there are meme accounts, Armenian meme accounts, which I was very pleased because I couldn't guess they are West or East Armenian because they were past anti jokes with Russian words and they were mounted tantic jokes, which was wonderful to see. But making this question a bit more serious and Jose Dolatian in the questions echoes what I wanted to ask as well. Um, what about future generations? What about the preservation of West Armenian? Because however many lovely bars at Cascade and Sarian house West Armenian speakers, this language needs proper structure, infrastructure to support it. Eastern Armenian has a state statehood we talked about. It. It's anchored there. Do you, see, do you see any movement giving West Armenian a serious status to be taught at school, to be preserved to be used, not just preserved, to be used actively. Hofsep, do you want to say anything about? I, I, I'm not aware of any specific um, measures being taken in terms of this. I mean, it's, it's whatever initiatives are there, like Abu mentioned, the things he's working on, I, I think it's great. Um, obviously, it would be nice, but at the same time, I'm personally, I think there are, there, not that, an, not that it's not an important issue, but I think as long as we're speaking Armenian, we're mixing East and Western, I'm, I, I'm, I don't see that much of an issue. As long as we're, we find ways to communicate with each other and coexist, it's great. But uh, in terms of uh, preservation, I, I'm, I'm not aware. I, I know some individuals like Abo have projects that they work on. Uh, uh, I know Kalus Kulbenkian has uh, funds projects like that. Uh, to make sure that Western Armenian stays quote unquote alive and uh, things like that. Uh, but in terms of state projects, I don't know. Uh, but I did want to say in terms of the previous question was uh, in, in terms of gen there's a generation difference. For example, our generation is something and their older generation who've come to Armenia with knowing uh, more, mainly West Armenian and having it more difficult to speak East Armenian. And then there, there's younger generations, for them that's easier to just um, speak East Armenian because they go to school. For example, uh, my cousins, um, I have two sets of cousins, different uh, age groups who are younger than me. Uh, some were born in Armenia and some uh, moved when they were very little. So for them, it's very automatic to use East Armenian. And they, uh, the middle ones speak Western Armenian as well. The younger ones understand, but they don't speak it as much. So it's also interesting to observe that and uh, to see how, how it, it becomes easy to use East Armenian and Western Armenian like that. Uh, and the family is also the first. Some are more like, let's make sure that we preserve, uh, we speak Western Armenian at home. And some people, they speak in Eastern Armenian to their children, like they don't see an issue with that. So it's it's also, very personal um, when it comes to that, I would say. Thank you, Hobseb. We have uh, questions are coming in and I could talk to <laughs> three of you for ages, but I'd like to ask a few questions which are echoing the discussions we've had earlier. Uh, Sagatel Pazil asks saying, do you notice that Syrian Armenians once again created their own very close capsule in Armenia? How do you explain it? And we discussed this just before the event started as an example of uh, uh, this project, which never happened, called uh, 
North Halep was it? I think it was oh. the North Halep. It was meant to be a, a residential. The building. residential, yes. Residential complex outside Yerevan, Ashtag, which never happened for a number of reasons. But, and I know people who were very against it, as it would create mm. more isolation of Syrian Armenians from local Armenians. But there were people who wanted to recreate their little Aleppo there. Yes. But it didn't happen. But the question is, is this ha happening automatically? Is this capsule being created? And actually, I'd like to add, if yes, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Is it a natural thing? It's, what do you think? Um, I think, yeah, um, I partly gave the answer. So greetings to Sagatel, um, he's our friend, I know him. Um, uh, um, yeah, you know, um, it's something um, sociocultural and true, like, uh, short history it happens when people come uh, to anywhere even in america we had in the usa we had little aleppo at kind of stuff so in the beginning um people like uh, search for their neighbors and uh, people like familiar people this is the first phase when they they are uh, making a move to another country so yeah at the first stage um we were always like going to um, organizations that invite Syrian Armenians events like closed events and so on and after that the second stage was more integrational uh, events uh, but at the first uh, phase yeah we had uh, as Saratel mentioned uh, the, the these closed circles of uh, Armenians of Syria or Aleppo or Middle Eastern Armenians but eventually um we we choose to not do that like uh, because per, because you live you study you work in Armenia and you naturally make friends and as I mentioned uh, you cannot just uh, be close with someone just for the reason of their the, the ethnicity just because they're from Aleppo um, so yeah that is the the main answer uh, slowly we had these circles, but now slowly uh, each uh, repatriated Armenian has uh, his and her own circle, which is consisted of different Armenians, even Armenians from uh, our local Armenians from Armenia, uh, even Armenians from Australia, and so on. Mm, thank you. Would would you agree with this, uh, Hurian Topset? Uh, yeah, I think Avo was ex explained it pretty well in terms of how it's natural for people just to go to, to the familiar. Uh, but uh, in terms of the question as well, yeah, I, I would I would say there there has been a sort of a community formed comprised of solely Syrian Armenians, and I think there there is a group of Syrian Armenians who are more comfortable of stepping out of that bubble and uh, interacting. Uh, and uh, in, you know, in, uh, let's say interacting with other Armenians, whether they're diaspora. So there's, I guess, two layers here as well. There's the, di the other diasporan Armenians, and then there are local Armenians. So some people would choose to interact with either of them or both of them. And then I think there is a group of Syrian Armenians who I would say still choose to solely interact with um, amongst each other or uh, some other diasporan Armenians, maybe from the Middle East, like let's say that's more familiar to them culturally uh, and things like that. Uh, and in terms of do I think this is a good thing or a bad thing personally, I, I'm not a fan of it. I think it's great for people to come together uh, I mean, in this context, we're speaking of Armenians, but whether Armenian or not, just uh, you know, come together and um, learn from each other and their differences and things like that. But um, uh, at the same time, it, it is what it is. Yeah, thank you. Hori, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think Avon was have added the, added the things already, but yeah, that, that Nor Halib was formed one way or another, maybe not the way it was planned, but but yeah, you can see like certain areas or certain buildings that are inhabited by, you know, Syrian Armenians uh, in, in Yerevan. But like Avo said, it's based on a referral system. You know, you're, you're new, you're coming and yeah, where should I live? And they refer you to this building or where should I buy a house? So yeah, it's it's like 
it's not a negative thing. It's because it's based off a referral system. Like that's what your friends told you. And the other thing that I would add is that now in Yerevan, you can see a lot of streets where you can find a lot of, uh, especially people from Aleppo opening businesses right next to each other. And that comes from the business mindset of things because you can find like a barber next to a sandwich shop next to a whatever. And that's like a very business mindset because, you know, you might leave the barber and want to grab a sandwich or something. So it's more of a strategic move rather mm -hmm. than creating your own little community. So I don't see in, in this case, I don't see a negative thing. It's more of like a business strategy. And, and that was course, also introduced in Armenia. I mean, yeah, uh, because economically Armenia changed as well. And they there there have been studies about this, like after the move of Syrian Armenians, like there was this like economical boost in Armenia because the way that business was done has also changed because Aleppo is famous for its for its economical status over centuries. So part of that was moved to Armenia and it added this another layer might be in a capsule, but it added this layer to especially Yerevan and now it's moving to other cities as well. Yeah, yeah, that's a good explanation. Thank you, Hori. And of course, Syrian Armenians brought tasty food to Armenia. Can we have a special mention of that? All, all the amazing restaurants and uh, now that's the amazing reputation they have. Um, it's eight o'clock here and much, much later in Yerevan where Avon Hofsepar. Just two comments we have in the chat. I'd like to mention just to illustrate how many series we need of this conversation to very different views from Manu Kakopian who talks about his desire to move to Armenia, to the homeland, which he mentions with the capital letter and he's concerned about prospects of finding a job and he wants to, he's worried about renewed fighting and he's asking, does anyone else feel like me? And Anuk, I think what today's discussion showed, there are so, so many opinions and routes and options people take. And there's a little anecdote as well from Arminak Topalian, who says, who met Syrian Armenians in Charen Havan, who told me that 50 years on, they still are called the Suryatsis. Only those born in Armenia are accepted Suryatsis. Well, Arminak, I'm 25 years in London. I'm still called the highest on sea. So that's <laughs> one thing which will never change. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, I think we have a little feedback form which my colleague are going to share. I would really appreciate anyone who was jo who is joining today, fill it in because it would be very helpful to see what people think. Uh, Avo, Huri, and Hofseb, is there anything you'd like to add? Anything we didn't? Um, yeah, I can. The uh, uh, previous question that uh, you have discussed um, for the infrastructures and the preservation, I want to add that. My vision is to have infrastructure in Armenia and from Armenia, we can spread to the diaspora, uh, preserving and having the Western, or the continuity of the Western Armenian. So, um, of course, the academicians also agree with this idea through uh, the experiments we had, because even like um, organizations like Alus Kubenkam before they were more like diaspora oriented, but uh, I have happened to see at the, the recent interview, they mentioned that they're also thinking, started to think uh, to, with, with the same direction, like having something, some basis in Western Armenia, especially now we have like uh, people here in West, uh, in Armenia that, that they are native Western Armenians. So yeah, the preservation should take that uh, road and also the education is the key uh, by adding the Western Armenian more and more in the public school. And uh, as um, a final, uh, as a final thing to do, like if families of Western Armenian background, they can took like a Western Armenian additional classes in the schools. So yeah, um, mainly the education will help do this and Armenia centered education uh, spreading through the world. Thank you, Avo. And can I add, we run at the Armenian Institute 
fantastic series of language classes by three teachers and we're very proud to have five Western Minion classes this year. I think one of our teachers, Sarin, is here in the audience. Sarin, we love yeah. and appreciate I know her from the university, yeah. We are extremely a lucky. To very have. good teacher. Yeah, we're very lucky to have teachers like Sarin Abgashans on our calendar and teaching. And of course, Eastern Armenian is taught by our own Gagik Stepan Sarkisian. So please, if you want to improve your Armenian, everyone come and join us. And through our three panelists, thank you so much. I know it's been very personal, somewhat painful conversation, but we really appreciate your honesty and your views and sharing this. We wish you best of luck in your next steps and we hope to see you again at Armenian Institute events. And to everyone present, please email us with your views and suggestions and personal stories. All our contacts on our website, we'd love to hear from everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. And we'll see you soon at our next event, which is next week. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you as well.